Now in chapter 22 and 23 of Genesis, uh, these chapters tell the story of uh, Abraham's climactic meeting with God, where he is prepared to offer his son as uh, a sacrifice. You know, that's where we left off last time. And I said that that particular episode had three main types that described important features of the Christian faith that were to come. Remember we said types, types are like previews. So in the Old Testament there are all kinds of types, people, situations, so on and so forth, that somehow preview situations, people, so on and so forth in the future. So in Genesis uh, there are several types uh, that we recognize from uh, Abraham's uh, meeting with God and his willingness to sacrifice Isaac. Um, the first type is the sacrifice of Christ itself. There's a type. I mean Isaac's willingness to be sacrificed to obey God's will, that is a type for Jesus' willingness to do the Father's will and be sacrificed himself. So there's a, you know, there's a preview of what was to come. And you have to be careful with types. You know, it's not an exact cookie cutter thing right down to every little detail, but it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an image that gives you an idea of what's to come. Another type is the idea is not a person. It's, it's, a, it's a thought, it's a system. Uh, and that is the type for vicarious atonement. Vicarious atonement is the concept of an innocent person dying for another person. One person paying the debt for someone else. That's what it means, vicarious, for someone else. Atonement, payment, okay? So Abraham offering Isaac that situation, it previewed the idea of vicarious atonement in the future, okay? And what was the vicarious atonement? Well, the ram was substituted for Isaac. Isaac was the one that was going to be sacrificed and at the last minute he was saved and the animal was put in his place. Is it a perfect image of Christ? Well, no, Christ is, was not, a, is not an animal, right? But the idea of substitution is there, okay? And then the third um, uh, preview, if you wish, the third type is the idea of the relationship between faith and works. All right? These ideas have to be introduced somewhere in the Bible, so they're introduced here uh, through the experience of Abraham and Isaac and what God has asked them to do. So Abraham was considered righteous because he believed. Okay, we understand that. But his belief in God naturally led him to works of righteousness, including the sacrifice of his own son. So the natural outgrowth of one's faith is good works. The type for that, we see it early on in Genesis. Now the Bible talks about it all the way through, doesn't it? And James you know, spells it out. You, know, you show me your faith by what you say, I'll show you my faith by what I do. You know, and faith without works is dead. You know, so in James, James is like describing it in detail, this idea of relationship between faith and works, okay? so we can understand it. But in Genesis, it's not explained uh, pedagogically. You understand? It's not explained as an idea. It's simply demonstrated through Abraham. Now, we need to remember one thing. Abraham's offer of Isaac is not a type for what faith demands. It is a type for what faith is capable of. We've got to be very careful because somebody reads that and they say, oh wow, I, I have, to, in order to be faithful, I have to get to the point where I'm able to offer my own child to God. Well, I don't know about you, but I, I don't think I could, I, I'm not there yet. There were times when my children were teenagers where it would have been easy. <laughs> and I'm sure you can relate to that. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, if I was honest with myself, I, there's no time in all the years I've been a Christian where I was at the point where I could offer any one of my children, you know, to, 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 if God had asked me to. And if that's what was required of me to be saved, well, I wouldn't be. So you have to be careful when you're looking at this type. It's not what faith demands. It's what faith is capable of. It, it's a demonstration. If your faith was strong enough, and God would know, 
You could do that if you had to. Thank goodness he doesn't ask us or demand that as a demonstration of our faith. Okay, so just like the natural outgrowth of an apple seed you know, is an apple, an apple tree rather, if you plant the seed and there's no tree that grows, then you can assume that the seed is dead because, well, there's no growth. In the same way, if one says he's a believer, calls himself a Christian, but there are no good works, there's no righteousness in his life, then we can assume that the seed, the faith, is dead because it's supposed to produce something, something. Now the idea is that it produces different things in different people. That's, that sometimes we go wrong there too. Just because it produces one thing in Ron over here doesn't mean it's going to produce the same thing in Steve or someone else. But God is working in all of us to produce the fruit, uh, the, the bearing of fruit uh, in each of our lives. So the chapters that we talked about end with the death of Sarah, eventually uh, her natural death, and then there's some historical information about Abraham remarrying um, and having six more sons, actually, after the death of Sarah with his subsequent wife. So with Sarah's death, it becomes important to Abraham to establish Isaac in his own home and see the next generation begin. And so the next chapters are going to tell the story and offer uh, the story of how Abraham organizes Isaac, find a wife for Isaac, and also some more types that are fulfilled in the New Testament. So we go to chapter 24, and chapter 24 is a search for a bride. Search for a bride. Uh, chapter 24, by the way, this is a little factoid here, is the longest chapter in Genesis. The longest chapter in Genesis. And it tells the story of Abraham's arrangement for a bride for his son Isaac. And now Isaac is 40 years old by this time. He still trusts his father's judgment in finding him a wife. This was an important choice because through this woman, the seed of the promise was to continue into the next generation. All right, so let's start reading chapter 24. It says, now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. Interesting, the hand under the thigh. Uh, some commentators say under the genitals. Uh, this idea was in connection with circumcision. That's the point. And uh, it was related to God's oath represented by circumcision. It was the most solemn of oaths, the proximity of the hand towards the a part of the body that was circumcised. You know? There was a relationship there. It was a very solemn thing because circumcision represented the covenant between God and man. So if you were going to make an oath and place your hand under the thigh, it was a very serious thing that you were doing. And the promise is that the servant or the steward would not take a wife from the pagans. That what you're going to promise me under oath that you will not do that even though, if you think about it, an alliance with a local chieftain would probably be profitable and would be easier and provide some protection. But Abraham knew that his uh, brother had children and grandchildren and from these he wanted to choose a wife for his son. So he doesn't send Isaac, interesting, he doesn't send Isaac to go look for a wife, he sends the steward to go look for a wife. Some reasons for that, perhaps he didn't want him to leave the land of Canaan as he, Abraham, Abraham left the land of Canaan, right? He went to Egypt you know, when it was a drought and uh, you know, he needed food and all that kind of stuff and he got himself in trouble. Every time he left he got himself in trouble so he learned, you know, okay, I, we're going to keep Isaac here in Canaan, in the land of Canaan. Also probably didn't want Isaac to return through the country where he had been originally marked for sacrifice. Because if he was going to go back to where the relatives were, he'd have to go by Mount Moriah. He'd have to go, oh yeah, that was the place where I nearly died. So he didn't want to go back 
over that idea. And from a theological perspective, it wouldn't fit the type, you know, the type, you know, Christ only died once, that thing only happened once. And so even in uh, Isaac's life, that thing only happened one time. There was no reminder of it, no second image of it. Some of the reasons why. And perhaps, you know, perhaps he, he, he didn't want Isaac to become too attached to the family of his future wife. Don't we see that happen a lot of times, even nowadays, right? A lot of times it's usually the, the guy who moves, if, he, if he's going to move, a lot of times the guy moves closer to the girl's parents than the than the other way around. You know? So that, that phenomenon was there as well. So let's keep reading. It says, uh, the servant said to him, suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Should I take your son back to the land from where you came? Then Abraham said to him, beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth and who spoke to me and who swore to me saying, to your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel before you and you will take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this my oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this, uh, concerning this uh, matter. And so a great caravan is formed and travels to the place uh, where um, Nahor lives. Once arrived, the servant makes an interesting prayer to God. So let's read verses 10 to 14. It says, Then the steward took ten camels from the camels of his master, set out with a variety of good things of his master's in his hand, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. He said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers, drink, and I will water your camels also, may she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown loving kindness to my master. So when he arrives, he makes an interesting prayer to God. You know, he knew the custom of the young girls drawing water and the usual courtesy of any of them offering him a stranger a drink if he asked. But what he was searching for was a special kind of person. In a word, you know, a person who would go the second mile. You know, a person that had some character. And to give Ten thirsty camels was a lot of work and it was demeaning work as well. So his prayer was that God would send one who would do it without him asking. So this person had a lot of faith in God. Of course, this was not impossible. It was very specific. It was within God's will. It also was used as a way of finding God's will where no other indicator existed. You know, uh, 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 if there was another way to find that person, you know, do you believe in the God of, of Abraham? You know, or some, but there was no way to find this girl. And so he devises a way and asks God to show. Don't we do that sometimes? We're not sure. You know, it's not a question of morality. You know, do I steal or do I not steal? That's an easy one. But you know, do, I, do I move to place A or place B or do I take job you know, number one or job number, you know, those type of decisions where we're not sure. I don't know about you guys, but I, you know, I say, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to make the best decision I can. And if that's the wrong decision, then you know, close the door. Let me know somehow that this is not the right thing for me. And so this was the, the kind of prayer that he makes. Now we're not going to read everything here. It's too long. But in verses 15 to 27, in this section, it tells how Rebekah was first to get the water and offer to give water to the camels. The steward then finds out that she is directly related to Abraham, being Isaac's second cousin. He immediately worships the Lord for having so quickly answered his prayer and answered it so perfectly. And he gives the girl expensive gifts. 
He inquires if he can stay with their family and she assures him that he can. And the thing that I'm thinking of, just, just you know, a little insight here is that God answered his prayer like right away. We're always ready to have to wait and wait and wait and wait, but it's not always like that. Sometimes God just answers your prayer right away. And I think we shouldn't be suspicious. <laughs> Sometimes like, okay, that was too easy. <laughs> the answer came too quickly, but you know, when, when we know God answers the prayer, you know, like my mother used to say, just say thank you and move on. Just say thank you and move on. And so we get to verse 28, pick it up there. It says, then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran outside to the man at the spring. When he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, this is what the man said to me, he went to the man, and behold, it was standing by the camels at the spring, and he said, come in, blessed of the Lord, why do you stand outside, since I have prepared the house and a place for the camels? So the man entered the house, then Laban unloaded the camels and he gave straw and feed to the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were uh, with him. One more verse here. Uh, but when food was set before him to eat, he said, I will not eat until I have told my business. And he said, speak on. So um, we, uh, we see Rebecca announce the arrival of the servant to her family and they, led by Laban, her brother, went to greet the servant welcome him into their home. Now the custom of the time was first you eat and then you discuss any business matters. And I don't think that's changed a whole lot, even at a business luncheon, right? You eat and then coffee comes and then okay, let's get down to business. But the servant was very eager to find out if Rebecca would return with him, so he refused to eat until they had concluded the business. Of course, in this day, Contracting marriages was like a business dealing, always lots of careful negotiation and contracts between, between the families. Then in verses 34 to 49, again, too long to read, let me just summarize. In this long discourse, the servant recounts the life and the situation of Abraham and his oath to come and find the bride for Isaac among his own people. He tells them of his prayer and the wonderful way that God answered him through Rebekah's action. He's not afraid to confess his faith, in other words, that he's a man of faith. Abraham is a man of faith. He finishes by putting the question to them about whether or not Rebekah will accept the proposal and return with him to be Isaac's wife. Think about that for a second. Whoa! Sight unseen. Sight unseen. There's another type here, type, and that is the type for the work of the Holy Spirit. The type for the work of the Holy Spirit going out and seeking the bride of Christ, which is the church. Let me show you. The man is sent out by the Father on behalf of the Son. Isn't the Holy Spirit sent out by the Father on behalf of the Son? The Son is not present, but the Holy Spirit is through the witness of the apostles, through the word, through the call of the gospel. Well, Isaac wasn't present. He's represented by the good news being brought by the steward. The Holy Spirit declares the wealth of the Father and the offer of becoming the bride of the Son with all the blessings that will uh, entail. In other words, we're the bride of Christ, you know, people, but have we seen Christ? Have we seen Him? No, we've just heard about Him. We've read about Him. We've heard about Him. Who has told us about Him? Well, the Holy Spirit has. How? Through the gospel, through the witness of the church, and so on and so forth. So there's a parallel here, okay? There's a parallel with the steward and the Holy Spirit. Also, the offer that he makes requires a decision, one that will have a lifelong effect on the individual. Imagine, the steward says, if you say yes, we're out of here. You know? And it's not like I have Facebook where I can be talking to my mom every day. You know? If she leaves and goes to Canaan, there's a good chance she may never see her parents you know, ever again, because in those days people didn't travel like that. So in his birth and relationship with Abraham and his bride, Isaac is used very much as a type for Christ. And the steward in this story, uh, very much a type of the Holy Spirit. So let's read another passage. 
It says, then Laban and Bethuel replied, the matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you bad or good. Here is Rebekah before you, take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. The servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, let the girl stay with us a few days, say 10, afterwards she may go. He said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, we will call the girl and consult her wishes. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Thus they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. They blessed Rebekah and said to her, may you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. Then Rebekah arose with her maids and they mounted the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. So here we see the family responding to the idea that if this has been the Lord's will, then they're eager to do it. You know, if it's of God, then I, I, I want to do it. Normally, uh, there would have been preparations and delay, but the servant insists on you know, departing immediately, and after Rebecca's positive response, they make ready to go the next day. Again, we see the combination of the type of the Holy Spirit and His work in the forming and the bringing of the Bride of Christ, the church, to God. So let's take a look at this type and how it works out. There is a need to make an immediate decision. Well, what, what is it that we say when we're preaching the gospel? Today is the day of salvation. Don't put off your decision till tomorrow and the next day to become you know, the bride of Christ. You know, well, in the same way, he's saying, no, no, we don't have 10 days. You need to make the decision now. And then once the decision is made, there's no going back. A new life is going to begin. As I said, Rebecca would be far from her family and would not likely see them again. Same thing with us. We become Christians. A new life begins, and it's not a, we, we certainly don't want to cut off our families and our friends, but we know that as we begin to follow Christ, we eventually begin to pull away from those people who don't follow Him and have, especially those who are antagonistic towards religion or towards faith. It's very hard to maintain that relationship, you know, as hard as we try. You know, my wife and I, we tried very hard to maintain a good relationship with our respective families who themselves were, I would say, nominal believers. You know, it's not they, they weren't pagans, they were, but they were nominal believers and religion wasn't something very important in their lives. You know, it didn't really factor into anything. Well, we're the ones that had to really work at maintaining those relationships because we had less and less to talk about. Okay? And so we see this happening here. And of course her response was enthusiastic and emphatic. She was ready, she was willing to leave right away. This was God's leading for her life and she was eager to do His will. So we get the feeling that Rebecca was a person of uh, spiritual character. Uh, when we know that the gospel is God's way of calling us, then we also should be eager uh, to follow that way. And so her family pronounces a blessing on her which reflects God's promise to Abraham and she leaves with the servant. A few more, a few more uh, uh, verses here. Uh, it says, now Isaac had come from going to uh, Bir Lahai Roy, for he was living in the Negev. Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening and he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, camels were coming. Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. She said to the servant, who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, he is my master. Then she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebecca, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Thus Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So no mention is made of the journey back, only the meeting, which could be, I mean, could be out of a movie, right? It could be out of a movie. You know, he's waiting, he's waiting, and then she appears. You know, and who's that guy? You know, well, that's, that's the guy. You know, and, 
And the Bible is very compact. You know? He takes her into his mother's tent because that's where she'll stay before they prepare the marriage and so on and so forth. And then he takes her as wife and she comforts him and he loves her. You know. um, uh, so these people that I've talked about are types for Christ and the church and their union foreshadows the union of Christ and the church at His return. So take, uh, 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 let's take a look, see if I've got that. There we go. So Isaac and Rebekah are types for Christ and the church. So for example, Isaac and, and Christ, okay? What are the similarities between? How is Isaac a type for Christ? Well, uh, promised long before His coming. Long before, in other words, before Isaac was born, Abraham and Sarah were told, you're going to have a son, but they, you know, he, was, he was predicted to come long before. In the same way, Christ was prophesied to come long before. Uh, he appeared at the appointed time. Jesus appeared at the specific time. Well, in the same way in Abraham and Sarah's life, he appeared at a spe very specific time. She was past childbearing age. He was past you know, being able to get somebody. That was an appointed time by God. Um, he was conceived miraculously, right? Isaac, uh, in the same way Jesus was conceived miraculously. They're not equal, obviously Isaac is a human birth, but a human birth done in a supernatural way, whereas Jesus, of course, uh, has a divine source for His birth. Uh, he was assigned a name before birth, Right? Isaac, they knew his, what his name was going to be before birth. Same thing with Jesus. Uh, he was offered in sacrifice by his father. Isaac was offered as a sacrifice by his father. And of course, Jesus was also. Uh, he was obedient unto death. Isaac, you didn't hear, see Isaac fighting Abraham off. Jesus was obedient unto death. He was brought back from the dead. We talked about that. He was as good as dead when he left with Abraham the first three days and he came back, and he became the head of a great nation in the same way Christ is the head of the church. And I didn't quote all the scriptures there, but I believe the scriptures are in your notes. All right, let's take a look at how Rebecca is a type for the church. Her marriage was planned long before. Um, uh, through Rebecca, God's um, uh, accomplishes his purpose, finding a wife for Isaac, maintaining the seed in the same way the church completes God's purpose on earth. We carry the seed. What's the seed? What's the gospel? Every generation we, we sow the seed so that more Christians uh, can be born. Uh, she shares the glory of the Son. In other words, out of, she, she's plucked from over here and made Isaac the carrier of the promise of God. She's made his wife and through her the seed will propagate. Well in the same way we share the glory of the Son because the Son is the head of the church and we share His, we share his glory. Uh, she learned of the Son, Isaac, through a messenger. Well, we also learned of the Son through a messenger. For each of us it was different. Could have been our parents, a friend, a tract, something, right? Uh, she left all to go to be with the Son. We leave everything to go to be with Christ. She, accompanied, uh, she was accompanied to the Son by the servant. The servant brought her all the way to Isaac. Well, the Holy Spirit brings us all the way to Christ. And then the final one, uh, she lived with the Son, she lived with Isaac, she married him, they remain married their whole life in the same way that the church uh, is married to Christ, if you wish, uh, for our entire life, not just for our life, but for eternity. So you know, we're not trying to force this here. It's just that God uses the situations and people to um, teach every generation what is going to come so that it isn't a huge surprise. It wasn't a huge surprise that God's plan to save man uh, included a system of what's called vicarious atonement. Why is that not such, such a huge surprise? Well, for thousands of years, the Jews 
used the sacrificial system, you know, vicarious atonement in their religion. So to preach that Jesus, the Lamb of God, died for the sins of men, this was not a concept that was so wild and crazy you know, that nobody could understand it. The Jews certainly could understand the idea of substituting an innocent for the sins of, you know, they, oh, we get it, we've been doing that for a thousand years, you know? and now the fulfillment comes, not a, a lamb and animal, but the lamb of God, and now, oh, that's what the, all of that meant. Okay? So that's what these types are for in the Bible. They simply prepare generation after generation to get the full picture when it's finally fulfilled in the new. All right, so a couple of lessons from this uh, thing. Um, you know, just practical lessons for us, because we'll say, you know, what do I get out of this? So what, I'm going home. You know, what, am I, what do I get out of all of this, other than just information? Well, one of the lessons, be specific in your prayers. Even though the servant knew he was generally doing God's will, when he was unsure, he was specific in his prayer. He didn't test God, he simply wanted a clear indication of what God's <coughs> will was. So if there are no instructions from the word of God, or if there are no good precedents or experience to help form our decisions, we have a good example here to encourage us to be specific in asking God to direct us. Dear God, I don't want to make a mistake and I really want to do what you want me to do, but it isn't clear. Could you please clarify it for me? And then wait. Specific. And a lot of times people say, I don't know what to pray, or you know, what, what process should I be going through while I'm praying? And usually my answer is, well, the process should be, try to clarify your prayer. Try to make it a little clearer, okay? Be a little more specific as to what you want happen. And when you do, sometimes you realize in doing that, oh my goodness, I don't think that God would want to even give me that thing. I want a whole lot more money, you know, a bigger cash flow, you know what I mean? Then you look back at your history and every time you had a lot of money, you made a lot of mistakes, you know? So uh, yeah, be clear. Okay, number two, character counts. Note that Abraham wanted a wife for his son that was a believer and that was of his own family. And God provided this and much more. She was eager to serve. She was fervent in her faith. She was eager to do God's will. She was brave, ready to brave, uh, leave her home, go to a foreign land, marry a man she had never seen. You know, we all want our children to marry well, right? Isn't that a prayer? Every parent prays that. Oh God, please. You know? But we need to teach them from a young age what it is that they are looking for. <laughs> you know, we fell in love. Why? Well, he was a good dancer. Oh, really? <laughs> How about that? Or he had a big car, he had a car, it was just, you know. So I think young people a lot of times don't know what they're looking for. We, we need to help them formulate what it is that they're looking for. And I'm looking at the room and I think for all of us, that's too late, you know what I mean? For good or for bad, because all our kids are all grown up, probably all of them married and, and gone, you know. But it's okay, the grandkids are coming up and, you know, it's okay to plant the seed of, this is what you need to be looking for in your friends and in your buddies. This is the kind of people you need to be looking for. Because I always told my kids, you, know, you, 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 you date who you hang around with and you marry who you date. You, know, you don't hang around with these kind of people over here and then out of the blue marry somebody over there. You usually marry somebody who you're hanging around with, so be careful. Anyways, I'm sure we know that in this class. And then, of course, it's all about Jesus. From beginning to end, the Bible is about Jesus. It was written to introduce us to Him, to help us know Him, to lead us to Him, to help us live within Him, and to remain faithful to Him. This is why I spend so much time about the types, about the types, because the Bible is about Christ. It, from beginning to end, it's about Him. So I'm always trying to bring the lesson or the material back to where's the connection to Jesus? Well, today we looked at where's the connection to Jesus here in Genesis. Every book is about just Him. Whether it's history or theology or type, the central theme of the Bible is Jesus. And when we have this understanding, we can be sure that we've, understand, we've understood the primary lesson 
of the scripture. So if you walk away and say, you know, we went to our Bible class and we learned some stuff, you know, how do you know that you have learned the most important thing in this lesson today? Well, I think the answer is you have learned the history and a bit of the society and what went on here, but most importantly, you have learned how this material connects to Jesus. If we know that, we've learned the important thing about this material. There's other stuff, perhaps a Hebrew scholar could come along or a historian or an archeologist could come and teach us things that are fascinating, you know, kind of color around the edges. But the, but the core of it is, how does this connect to Christ? And I think we've kind of covered that. So don't be discouraged. We are learning the things we need to be learning in this class. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.